Hey YouTube, what's going on? It is April 10th, 2020. It's Friday. Good Friday. Why is it Good Friday? It's Good Friday because today is a day that we take into remembrance that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was nailed to the tree. Cursed be he that hangeth upon a tree. But in our case, blessed is he, right? For we know who was hung on that tree. We know who suffered and endured the shame and the humiliation, despised it, but did the Father's will and allowed himself to be put to death for our sins, to shed his blood to cover us. Now, the video I'm going to make today, guys, is going to be a short one. I'm going to, I'm doing a little bit of a study here in Samuel, and so, first Samuel, and I thought I'd just kind of share it with you. Uh, I'm going to start in chapter four here. I'm not going to really get very far. I'll just give you a little bit of a background and kind of give my, this video will be like an introduction. So Samuel, okay, he grew up in the house of Eli. Who was Eli? Eli was the priest for Israel, okay? And as he got older and was getting um, stricken in years and whatnot, his eyes were becoming dim, he trained up Samuel in the ways of the Lord. Now, Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. People are going to say, oh, you didn't even pronounce those names right. Well, hey, what can you say? Listen to how I talk in general. I, I mispronounce a lot of stuff. And, and I can't even help it. I can't even pronounce my own last name, Branscom. Branscom, <laughs> right? <laughs> Anyways, bronze cone. So, Hophni and Phinehas, by succession, became the priests for Israel. And what were Hophni and Phinehas doing? They were corrupt men unto the Lord, wicked men before the Lord. Yet they were priests, supposed to be priests unto the Lord in the house of the Lord at that time, which was in Shiloh. So, what were they doing? Well, they were taking offerings for themselves. They were taking whatever they wanted from the offering. Normally the priest always would take a portion, right? For doing for his service in the Lord. Well, they were taking their portion and God's portion, okay? What else were they doing? They were having sex with widows who were coming to the temple. They, it was so bad that people stopped going to the house of the Lord, okay? They stopped going to the house of the Lord. Because why? Because it was a den of corruption. Okay? So in chapter 4, right, we... Samuel has come up. He has been... Basically, he had the dream in chapter 3 where God spoke to him and pronounced judgment on the house of Eli, where both he and his sons would die. And now Eli wasn't necessarily a bad man. He was a priest unto the Lord, and he um, did the Lord's work for his life. But through succession of his sons, right, they were not men of God. And Eli, like, a lot of parents will do, a lot of um, preachers and missionaries and people that um, have roles in the church, you'll often find that their children don't necessarily reflect the same kind of standard that the parents had, okay? And in a lot of cases, you'll see the parents look the other way. They won't correct their children, and this is a mistake. And obviously, a lot of people that are outside the church, they see this stuff, and they say, well, 
they're running the church and they can't even run their own household. Well, this is true and this is a mistake by these people, but it is also a judgment onto yourself when you look at somebody and you expect that just because they're a righteous person that their offspring will also be the same. You see, the children have to make their own decision, right? Even though the parents are doing the work of the Lord, serving in the house of the Lord, it doesn't mean that their children are going to be the same way. But what it does mean is that those people that are serving, they have to be that much more strict with their children so that their children do not rebel. Because again, what happens? A lot of people that grow up in the institution, that grow up um, being a missionary's kid, a preacher's kid, a deacon's kid, just in the church, they tend to, not all the time, but in cases, in this case for sure, they go completely the opposite direction that they're supposed to go. And you can't allow that to happen, but also to some degree, once those kids grow up, I mean, that's their decision to do that, right? So when Eli had time and opportunity to correct his children, he didn't do so. He was not able to do so. And so the Lord pronounced judgment on the whole house of Eli because, again, who much is given to, much will be required. And in this case, the lives of Eli's children and his own life was going to be required of this. Now, we're going to find that out later on in this study because right now we're just going to focus on chapter 4 and we're not going to get very far in chapter 4. Again, this is just the opening and I know I'm talking a lot but I'm just trying to lay the groundwork here guys so when Samuel in chapter 3 tells Eli this dream right because he has the dream in the night and Eli is awoken and he says to Samuel tell me the dream and don't hold anything back from me and Samuel's like uh, you, 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 oh, oh, oh. right and Eli's like don't you dare hold anything back from me. Tell me everything, right? And so then Samuel tells him the dream, and then Eli's like, no, right? But what does he say? He says, you know, Lord's will is the Lord's will, and whatever he um, says is to be done is to be done. So on to chapter 4. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. Now, that's, chat, that's verse 1. I'm going to keep going here. Just going to read verse 2. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. In array, so they prepared themselves for battle, right? They got themselves ready, all juiced up ready to go okay and when they joined battle Israel was smitten before the Philistines and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men now that's as far as I'm gonna go for anybody that is familiar with this story you know what happens here right they get smitten and, um, of course, Hophni and the people are like, oh, what are we going to do? And Hophni and Phineas are like, hey, I got a great idea. All these times before we went into battle, we, we took the Ark of the Covenant. It went before us and we defeated our enemies because the Ark of the Lord went before us. So now Hophni and Phineas said, let's just get the Ark of the Covenant ready and we'll march that baby down before us and we'll just walk right through those Philistines now the problem with that is is that Hophni and Phinehas are wicked men and they don't have the spirit of the Lord they're walking completely in the flesh they are completely reprobate in fact right they don't represent God and God didn't tell them to do this they decided on their own anytime before this happened right God said you know this is what will happen when you go into battle. Do this, and they did, right? Don't do this, and they don't, 
right? But in this case, they had the bright idea that, hey, we got the Ark of the Covenant, we've got the Ark of God, he's going to go before us, and we're going to defeat our enemies, just like every time before. But we know, if you know the Bible, that even before this, there's been times where the Israelites also said, hey, we have God on our side, we're just going to go in into battle and whoop these guys. And then, who ends up getting chased away with their tails between their legs? The Israelites. Because God didn't tell them to. Right? So, Israel was a light onto the nations. Okay? They were God's representative onto the nations. And like we said, to much who is given, much will be required. So, we see that when Israel obeyed the Lord, they were blessed greatly. When they disobeyed the Lord, they were cursed, okay? God rained down judgment upon them. He brought oppressors upon the people, okay? In this case, the form of the Philistines, the people of the sea. They came and they started taking over, taking portions of the land, portions of the inheritance, and they were moving in and they were oppressing the Israelites. This is before David, right? And if you, if you don't know any of this stuff, this is this opening is a great time for you to go and start reading these chapters. We're going to be doing, you might as well read chapter 3 and learn about how Samuel came to be. And then read 4, 5, 6, and 7. That's basically this story. So the other nations, okay, they didn't have the Ark of God. They didn't have the Covenant of God. They didn't have the commandments of God. So they can get away with all the abominations that they've committed. Just like when Abraham, before he went into the land, right, he had to go and rest in Egypt for a bit. God told him, here, look, this is the land you're going to have. As far as you can see, this is going to be yours, right? Your seed's going to be multiplied as the sand of the sea, okay? If any man can count it, that'll be the number, okay? Obviously, no man can count the grains of sand that are on the earth. Now, when... The, at that point in time, Abraham was not to go into Canaan. They weren't to be in the promised land at that time. They were to go into bondage in Egypt. There was lots of time to happen um, before they were to go into the promised land. And God said, the abomination of the Amorites, okay, has not yet been fulfilled. So, God is very long-suffering. And he long-suffers a lot of these heathen nations. He gives them lots of time to repent of their ways but oftentimes obviously they don't because the further and further they go down this path of wickedness right the harder it is to get yourself back out of it you see what i mean you become a reprobate where, where there's no turning back because you give yourself over to all kinds of wickedness and in this case here in the case of Israel, in the case of us today, right, if you're a Christian, you get chastened more than people that are unsaved for just little things. Things that other people get away with, you won't get away with. People won't let you get away with it. Why? Because you are meant to be a light onto others, okay? And if you aren't getting chastened, well, then chances are you're not a son, or you're not a daughter. Okay? Because whoever the Lord loves, he chastens. Just like our children. If we love our children, we chasten them when they do wrong. Okay? And believe me, I know a little bit about being chastened. Okay? So, carrying on here. So we read the first two verses. That's as far as we're going to go here. Because we know what happens, right? They have the ark to go before them. They march down this great big big hoorah, right? This big show coming down and the Philistines see them coming. They're like, oh man, the Ark of the God of Israel, right? They know what happened. They know what happened in Egypt. They know what happened to um, Amalek, right? They know what happened to Og. They know what happened to um, Jericho. They know what happened to all these other nations that were smoking before, smitten before the Israelites, Okay, they know the power of the God of Israel. Okay, now they have this big hoorah chant, and then what ends up happening? 
they end up they they end up wiping out the Israelites they kill Hophni and Phineas and they take the ark back to Ashdod and this is ba the basis of my opening here okay so Ebenezer means stone of help or rock and that's where the Israelites pitch their tent okay when the Philistines took the ark they took it back to the city of Ashdod Ashdod means diffusion inclination and theft that's the definitions that I found for it. okay so diffusion is the spreading of something through particles gases liquids um, inclination is a natural tendency or urge to act or feel in a particular way and theft is the action of stealing okay so I just kind of put this together so the the natural urge natural feeling that the Philistines had was that the Ark of the Covenant had some sort of supernatural power given to those who possessed it in this case it was the Israelites okay so which led to the act of stealing the Ark for the purposes of diffusing its power throughout the cities of the five lords of the Philistines okay but the end result if you know the story if you don't like I say go and read this stuff because we're going to get into it more obviously more details the end result being the spreading of God's wrath and his judgment throughout the city and the countryside of the Philistines now that's a pretty neat definition right and that's that's pretty neat how that all goes together and I ain't you know what I mean like I just you know that's just the definition I just kind of put that together nothing nothing really clever about that it's just it's just what I saw so Israel pitched beside Ebenezer. It's important to note that at this point in time in the story, there, there was no such thing as the Ebenezer stone, okay? Rather, it came as a result of this story, okay? To those that are reading the scriptures after the events, right, they would know this location, okay, and its name, and therefore the writer simply calls it the place where they pitched their tents, Ebenezer okay so just in other places in the Old Testament we see this right and the city is called this unto this day and such and such is known as this unto this day right even unto this day they call it this right that's all throughout the Old Testament right because the people reading it understand the history of it okay it saves the reader time by calling it by the known name while also being a foreshadow of what is to come. And you have to read the entire story to understand it. It's, you know, it's really quite masterful and again shows how powerful and how much depth there is to God's Word. Um, again, if you first read it and you read the definition Ebenezer, you'll think, well, there's not much hope here. Not much of a, a rock of salvation, right? The Israelites got discomforted. They got the ark stolen. They got their butts whooped. Hophni and Phinehas were killed, right? There's not much, it's not much of a stone of hope, right? But again, to the unbeliever, right, they would read that and they could have a chuckle at that, right? It sounds uh, in direct contradiction of what the name is. But again, you have to read the entire story you can't just cherry pick something and it shows you again how the Bible isn't just written by man it's the inspired word of God the breathed word of God okay given to holy men of God right who were inspired by God to write down his word okay the events that took place so we'll go further into this later I just want to lay the groundwork here um, Ebenezer is stone of hope and we are going to find that out 
in the next few um, installments of this video. So that's all for now. Be Branscombe.